reports of alien sightings have reached astronomical numbers, but are they hoaxes? It was quite easy to reproduce these pictures. Or close encounters. What I saw was real. It was down real. What is the truth? Are aliens closer than we think? Decide for yourself on Discovery Channel's Alien Invasion Week. We have long been intrigued by the notion of life on other planets, and our popular culture has been filled with images of UFOs for decades. But the first widespread documented sightings of UFOs in the real world came in the closing months of World War II. The sightings we saw were, I think, were in about uh, in the 44 and November or December then. We'd see uh, these uh, balls of light that would fly off the wings of our airplane. The one I saw was uh, like a white light. A lot of the other people reporting in it saw um, old red lights, and some of them would see some green lights, and some of them reported that they would, that they would try to chase one why they couldn't, they never could catch it. We would turn into it, and it would turn with us. And we'd turn away from it, and it would still turn with us. And I put my gun sights on, trying to get on it, but I never could. We flew the uh, British Mosquito, which was capable of 450 knots. And we opened it up a number of times and uh, tried to close with it. And um, we, we never came anywhere close to it. The pilots dubbed these unidentified flying objects Foo Fighters, but still don't know if they were German secret weapons, optical illusions, or something else entirely. I think the book is open on whether it was um, imagination, hallucination, or really extraterrestrial or uh, German ground control object, but I haven't seen anything in 50 years that change the uh, perception of what they were other than unidentified flying objects. Two years after the end of World War II in Washington State, a private pilot named Kenneth Arnold reported seeing peculiar looking aircraft near Mount Rainier. The craft appeared to wobble and flip and were flying faster than any Arnold had ever seen. Word of this sighting was spread by the press and the term flying saucers was coined. Although life in post-war America seemed tranquil enough, such reports of unidentified flying objects began to multiply. Were these UFOs Soviet reconnaissance planes? Could this explain their apparent presence around U.S. military bases? Fear began to emerge. Atomic secrets could be at risk. National security at stake. Given their potential significance, UFO reports and rare films from witnesses did not go to the police or scientists. Rather, for 22 years, they were collected as part of Project Blue Book for Air Force investigation. The head of the project explained why. First of all, to try to determine if the UFO phenomena presents a threat to the security of the United States. And second, to determine if the UFO phenomena exhibits any technological advances which could be channeled into research and development. Finally, in 1969, the files were closed. The Air Force conclusion, no threat and poor data. They looked at 3,201 sightings. They categorized every single one. They did a quality evaluation of every single one. And what they found was 21% of the 3,201 cases that they examined had to be listed as unknowns, completely separate 
and distinct from the 10% that were listed as insufficient information. They found that the better the quality of the sighting, the more likely to be an unknown. And yet, what did the Secretary of the Air Force say to the public? He said that on the basis of this report, we believe that no objects such as those popularly described as flying saucers have overflown the United States. Still, many remained unconvinced by the official government findings, and their disbelief seemed to find support for a time in 1987. It was then that British researcher Tim Good laid his hands on a briefing document which was addressed to President-elect Dwight D. Eisenhower and dated November 1952. The papers appear to reveal the U.S. government's clandestine recovery of aliens after the 1947 crash of an airborne object in New Mexico. Those in charge of the recovery were called the Majestic 12. According to this document, a local rancher reported finding a flying saucer that had crashed 75 miles northwest of Roswell Army Airfield. During the recovery, four dead aliens were supposedly found. Their remains were allegedly removed and sent to several different locations to be analyzed. There was no question that the importance of these documents was monumental. I mean, uh, nothing like it before had surfaced. It's dynamite. Proves there are flying saucers, alien visitors, the whole business. The implication is, one, Earth is being visited by extraterrestrial spacecraft. Two, the government has known not only that that is true in the abstract, but has had pieces of wreckage and bodies of extraterrestrials since at least 1947. But not everyone was as sure. Within about 10 minutes of seeing the documents, based upon my research into UFO documents up to that time, I, I knew these things weren't real. Among the documents Tim Good received was a memorandum from President Truman to his Secretary of Defense. Critics claim that his signature is identical to that on another document, a problem for document analysts. Now, anyone familiar with uh, forensic document analysis uh, knows that a person signing their name never signs it twice in the exact same way. And that suggested to us that the signature from the later genuine non-UFO document was cut out by the forger and pasted onto this false executive order to lend an air of authenticity to it. They say the signature on there is identical to another signature from a different memo, which I found in the first place. I say if you hold them up to a light table, they are clearly not identical. Regardless, though Tim Good admits the letter itself may be a fabrication, he does not dismiss the information contained within. I am convinced that whoever fabricated that document, if it was fabricated, must have had inside knowledge. There's no way it could be otherwise. And there's no question that the Majestic 12 papers have indeed pointed people in the right direction. And I think essentially the information contained therein is accurate. Eventually, to get a more complete overview of government documentation regarding UFOs, the Citizens Against UFO Secrecy went to court. The National Security Agency, however, tried to block them. We filed for the 21-page above top secret affidavit. The judge had referenced it in his finding, and we eventually got it. The only trouble is, as you start to go through it, you find that it's blacked out and blacked out, and pretty soon all blacked out. 75% of the document isn't there, and people say, scrape away the black, there's nothing underneath. They Xerox it first. The cover-up alone is proven by the released documents, released by agencies such as the FBI, who denied any involvement in UFO research until the Freedom of Information Act showed that they'd been lying. They released 1,100 pages of documents. CIA denied any interest in the subject. Suddenly, we have now, I would think, thousands of pages of UFO-related information.
dating back to the 1940s, which quite clearly indicates that there has been a cover-up. Certainly, the private center for UFO studies thinks there is validity to UFO work. Over 100,000 cases are archived there. I am convinced by over 20 years of, of work in this field that there is a mysterious phenomenon occurring that, that is being neglected by science, not by the public, but by science. Um, and it's to science's detriment that it's doing so. When the War of the Worlds radio drama was broadcast in 1938, how did some listeners react to hearing of a Martian landing in their hometown? When Alien Invasion Week returns, not having heard the radio disclaimers, some War of the Worlds listeners crept through the night fog looking for Martians and shot a water tower. Now back to Alien Invasion Week. In March 1990, in the former Soviet Union, fighter planes scrambled to investigate pulsing lights northeast of Moscow. For three and a half hours, they stalked the lights, which moved at speeds up to 3,000 miles an hour. No radar image appeared on the screens of ground stations, but photographs were taken, and thermal imaging produced results. For the chief of air defense forces, these secret results were proof enough of UFOs. Though journalists are asking if there are other sightings, these 1990 cases were only one supported by evidence. This is the only case for which there is real proof. Nor was it ever considered that the sighting was that of a stealth bomber. We never thought it was an American stealth aircraft. The radar characteristics are not the same. Stealth behaves like a plane in terms of speed and maneuverability. UFOs are very different. The unwritten rule, do not fire on UFOs. As far as official instructions are concerned, we in air defense have certain unwritten rules that mean we do not fire at UFOs. From 1977 on, an official Soviet Ministry of Defense study has collected hundreds of reports of UFOs, reportedly to gain alien technology for military use. files list many cases. In one case, a pilot reported finding a light closing in on him, at which point his aircraft went into rapid descent. Though he landed safely, there was damage to the left wing. Never before seen in the West, this amateur footage purports to show a UFO over the parliament in Vilnius, capital of Lithuania. The craft hovers noiselessly, appearing to land. At dawn the next morning, local militia videotaped this nearby. Enhanced, the night visitor looks like this. It moves unlike a normal helicopter or plane. In another Soviet incident, hundreds of people thought they saw a giant UFO over the city of Petrozavodsk in northwest Russia in 1977. But studies established that it was the burning booster of a secretly launched satellite. Still at the Soviet Academy of Sciences, such phenomena are considered worthy of serious inquiry. 
In addition to the country's military study, this governing body for academic research coordinates a countrywide collection of information for scientific analysis. Here, the Central Committee for the Study of UFOs gathers data from 10 other scientific academies. I would like to say a few words about our methods. For some sightings, we carry out investigations in the field. A sighting here has resulted in 12 years of research. Train passengers reported seeing a UFO. A metallic craft that landed nearby. Biologist Yuri Simyakov believes there have been permanent changes to the scene. We believe this could have been a landing site. This is very interesting place because it has such strong magnetic fields. His experiments find living creatures shun this spot. These findings are consistent with studies of other UFO sites, where the ground appears empty of all life, even microbes. Most puzzling of all, Earth samples taken from landing sites contain tiny spheres. His work has led him to conclude these spheres were extraterrestrial in origin, containing DNA, the seed of life itself. In the U.S., tests of these samples were divided. Results indicate that the spheres are either of unknown origin or common parts of groundwater filter systems. Yet some Russian researchers believe alien microtechnology is being placed here by interplanetary prowlers. Given worldwide interest, researchers have attempted to classify reports of UFO sightings and encounters with extraterrestrials. When an unidentified flying object is seen, but nothing more, it is labeled a close encounter of the first kind. Where traces are left, it becomes the second kind. Then there are close encounters of the third kind, where people report observing aliens. In close encounters of the fourth kind, the witness actually interacts with the aliens. In November 1980, in Tudmorton, England, an experienced police officer, Alan Godfrey, was on night patrol when he saw an object he could not identify. I was on a 10-6 night duty, so I decided that I would go up to this local council estate. As I was about to turn, I saw another 500 yards up the road, this object. As I got near to this object, it became apparent to me that what I was looking at wasn't something that I, I would normally find in the early hours of the morning in Todmorden, you know. I th thought it could have been a hot air balloon that had come down, but obviously as I got nearer and nearer, I realised that this was a metallic, man-made craft. It was a nuts and bolts thing. It wasn't an hallucination, it was real. This object was 20 foot wide. It's 14 feet high. It's diamond shaped. The bottom half of it was rotating. The top half was stationary. It had a bank of dark windows, or could have been panelling. And I cut out the car, picked a brick up, and throwing it at it, and I probably found out whether the window was or not. The trees that lined the road were shaking violently. But yet, whilst I was sat in the car, I didn't feel any vibration. And I didn't hear any noise. But I certainly wasn't going to get out of the car. I picked my clipboard up, put it on my knee, and proceeded to draw it. Now, as I'm drawing the object, I'm suddenly at the other side of it, driving the police car. And the object had gone. Gone, too, was a period of time. 
after hypnotic regression, the officer remembered more. There's a total blackness. Then there's a feeling of floating, as though either me on my own or the vehicle, whatever, is floating. Then I wake up in a room. Now, in this room, there is a very tall humanoid, for want of a better word. He's about six foot to six foot six, very tall, thin, with a beard. He had a skull cap on and he had this white gown on. What happens then is I'm asked to get on this bed. Now, the questions asked to me then is, how did he, you know, he wants to get on Because I said, well, his mouth's not moving, he's not talking, it's just he wants me to get on the bed. Obviously, whatever it was, was having some sort of influence over my thoughts. Yet, I did feel at ease with him. I felt comfortable with him. I got the impression that I'd met him before. I, I wasn't in fear of him or anything like that. I didn't feel in any danger. So I'm on the bed, and then these horrible little things come. They are a lamp-shaped head with black, dark eyes. That's the best way I can describe them. And there was about seven or eight of them. Officers nearby said they saw a light in the sky, and Alan Godfrey insists his encounter was genuine. I know that night what I saw was real. It was damn real. Before the term flying saucer was coined in 1947 by Kenneth Arnold, what were UFOs called? We'll be right back with the answer and more of Alien Invasion Week. UFOs were often called ghost rockets. One of the earliest sightings occurred in Scandinavia in the 1930s. We now return to Alien Invasion Week here on the Discovery Channel. In 1974, in Landrithlow, Wales, residents felt severe tremors. Tremors, which some felt were not naturally caused. what had happened. I don't think it was an earthquake somehow. You know, I still think it wasn't an earthquake. John Roberts wasn't the only one shaken that day. Hugh Edwards thought he saw a flying saucer. I saw this object come in along the mountain with the size of a bus, really. Uh, it's right in the middle, and the lens. Came, came across the mountain towards the road there. As it went over there, it dipped, and I thought it was going to crash. It dipped out of sight into the valley. Well, I'd heard so much about flying saucers, and I thought, well, this is it. And the only sound I heard of it, like, like a shh going through the air. I was very surprised to see it, really. The district nurse thought, perhaps, a plane was down. I thought there might be an air crash. Maybe, as a nurse, we could help giving first aid. So I called to my daughters, and we got into the car, and we made our way up to the mountain. We drove a fair way along the mountain road, and to our left, we could see a huge orange ball sitting on the mountain, glowing. Yeah, we stopped Just... and we started looking what we thought was going to be an aircraft yeah. on fire. So we'd envisaged sort of, oh, God, you know, there might be bodies if it was an aeroplane crash, and we weren't too happy at that prospect, but we were quite surprised 
to see, see this big reddish orange ball just sitting there. There were no flames and it was so um, uniform, the shape, the round spherical shape of it made us realise we weren't looking at an aircraft. Um, there were no flames jumping, but it was, it was pulsating, this red orange object that we saw. And we could see little lights, like fairy lights, coming towards the object in a zigzag pattern and we assumed at that time possibly there was someone going to see what was what. With hindsight, we realised so, that the search party couldn't have got there, located it and got there in the time it had taken us to go from the village up to the, the mountain. mountain. Yeah. No one could have organised themselves to get to the object that we saw. Since no search party went out that night, nothing was ever found at the scene. But astronomer Ron Madison has proposed that what the villagers saw that night was a meteorite or fireball, and that it coincided with an earthquake at a nearby fault. Thinking that that explosion might well have been due to an impacting piece of rock, our first reaction was to try to estimate the energy involved. And it seemed to us to be something that would correspond to an explosion of the size of about 600 tons of TNT. We got letters from as far apart as Penzance and Northern Ireland and Derby, all reporting seeing a bright light, maybe comparable with a half moon in brilliance, moving across the sky at the speed of an aircraft, but with no sound, and uh, trailing uh, smoke, just like you would expect something on fire to be crashing. In the next few days, we were to realize, of course, that the village was not very far from the Bala Fault, which is active and has been moving steadily over thousands of years. And unbeknown to us at the time, originally, there had been on that evening a movement on the fault, and that is incontrovertible evidence. This was a coincidence. There were fireballs in the sky at the same time that there was a triggered movement along the Banner Fault. Another highly publicized British sighting proved equally attributable to natural causes, but not before many believed that they too had seen a UFO. In March 1981, Policeman Derek Ingram saw and photographed what many thought to be an alien craft that had landed on a fell or hillside. I was in the uh, kitchen of the police house at Craco. I looked out across the fell, with the kitchen window backs onto the fell, and I saw a very intense bright light, a big band of light on the rock face of the fell. I watched the light for maybe 10 minutes, and I thought it was worth taking a photograph of. It was un unusual. I actually drove up onto the hill and walked across the fell to try and find something on there, maybe something had been dropped or something had happened. Uh, there was nothing up there. I couldn't find anything at all that would explain the lights. The faithful saw a finned craft with three lights. And as the press had a field day, researchers tried to identify the visitors. After the photographs had been taken, they were, the negatives were given to the Yorkshire UFO Society, who spent two years investigating the case. They sent the negatives to Grand Source Watch in America and to a very well-known German UFO photographic analyst. Neither groups of people could come up with a satisfactory explanation, and in fact, Grand Social Watch actually said snow was the best possibility for it. In 1983, the Oxford UFO Society went public with the case and actually claimed that it was the best evidence yet for a structured craft being sighted in, in the British Isles. The investigation continued, and in 1987, we'd almost given up hope of ever finding out what caused it, and I was on a, a weekend trip in the Dales with my wife and son and decided to stop and show them Krakow Fell. And lo and behold, what should be staring back at me from the cliff face but the Krakow UFO? What they found was certainly a surprise. Right, we're about 1,100 feet up a Yorkshire cliff, and this is the Krakow UFO. It might not look like much from close up, but you can actually see the three balls of light on the photograph. They're created there, there, and there by a complicated illusion 
uh, a mixture in fact of white lichen, green lichen, the Yorkshire gritstone rock which contains quartz crystals and the rainwater. All this when it's illuminated at certain angles by rain or damp it gives the illusion of three balls of light. Some days it can be very bright, some days it can be very dull. On the day in particular when Derek Ingram saw it, it was amazingly bright. Um, and that's what created uh, the feeling in him that he'd actually seen something totally unusual, even though he'd actually looked out of his window probably every day for the previous two years and not seen it. Though some sightings can clearly be explained by natural phenomena, UFOs continue to have a grip on the public's imagination that is not easily loosened. And there's no shortage of pranksters to capitalize on this fascination. In Gulf Breeze, Florida, in November of 1987, builder Ed Walters claims he took Polaroids of a UFO three times as big as a house. For him, it was just one of many such photo opportunities near abductions and glimpses of aliens. Though he sold two books worth, Ed would not allow his photos to be included in this program. Photographs such as these are not difficult to fake with a little know-how, a styrofoam model, and the right camera. It was quite easy to reproduce these pictures. He took the majority of his early pictures, about 30 pictures, uh, on a Polaroid 108 camera. It is very easy to double expose the film in that camera. If you don't pull the film out, you can press the button and expose that same piece of film again. You take a picture of the UFO model inside, you go outside, take a picture of the skyline, let the film develop, there you have your double exposure of a UFO flying in the sky. Still, Walters has his disciples, and photo analyst Bruce Maccabee is one of them. A government research physicist, Maccabee is a believer in UFOs and is the author of many scientific papers on them. I have analyzed all the uh, films and videos that have been taken by Ed Walters. I have uh, studied um, most of the videos, I guess, that have been taken by other people down there. And it's just sitting there. As far as Ed's pictures and videos are concerned, it's my opinion that they are real. I have analyzed these very carefully, taking into account all the uh, criticisms that have been leveled against them and have found reasons to reject the criticisms. In baseball, you get three strikes and you're out. For Ed Walters, in this case, strike one was when a model was found in the attic of his former home. Strike two was when a young man named Tommy Smith came forward and claimed that he was an eyewitness to Ed Walters creating double exposed UFO pictures. Strike three was when we went out and did photo experiments and were able to replicate many of these photos, especially the difficult photos like the UFO hovering over the road. So my conclusion is three strikes and you're out. We uh, published the first pictures of the Gulf Breeze sightings back in uh, November of 1987. And uh, I was uh, trying to figure out exactly how to present them because I tried to run everything that happened locally in Gulf Breeze. Uh, when my folks came in and uh, I said, you're not gonna believe what we're getting ready to run in the paper this week. And I showed them the pictures. And they said, that's what we saw. It was primarily because of uh, the many other people in Gulf Breeze that witnessed the UFO, both the same night that Ed first got the pictures and many times after that, that uh, the Sentinel continued to carry the story. I have had three other daylight sightings and over 100 sightings at night at Shoreline Park in Gulf Breeze. I witnessed over 170 sightings. These were red lights, red and white lights, over and around Gulf Breeze, Florida. I've seen a silver flying 
dome in the sky that was unidentifiable. Never seen anything like that before, and it was just, it was unexplainable. But just across the bay from Gulf Breeze is the Pensacola Naval Air Base. One explanation that occurs to locals is that some of the sightings are illegal pranks by naval personnel at the base. Another possibility is that actual military craft are being confused with UFOs. For instance, would most people recognize UAVs, uninhabited aerial vehicles, designed for stealthy reconnaissance and secret observation? Yet despite the fact that certain sightings may be hoaxes or otherwise explained by natural or man-made phenomena, we keep on looking. Our fascination only grows as scientists uncover evidence of life on other planets. It only grows as it becomes increasingly reasonable to believe we are not alone in the universe. What are some of the most common traits of self-proclaimed UFO abductees? The answer is coming your way when Alien Invasion Week continues after these messages. Self-proclaimed UFO abductees report such common traits as missing or lost time and unexplained scars or markings on their body. We now return to Alien Invasion Week. If signs of life on Mars prove true, extraterrestrial life in general may be even more widespread. Astronomers calculate the number of civilizations we can expect to detect in space. They use the Drake equation. Professor Frank Drake. The first factor is the rate of star formation in our galaxy. Obviously, the more stars you make, the more potential abodes of life there will be. Some fraction of those stars will have planets. That's the second factor, the fraction which have planets. We then have to take into account the number of planets in each system, which are potential abodes of life. The next factor is the fraction of systems of living things which give rise to intelligence. The next factor is the fraction of systems and intelligent creatures which develop high technology, detectable technology. But how long do they last? How long are they detectable? Perhaps they're destroyed by cosmic accidents. Perhaps uh, in an ugly way through nuclear war. More likely, we think they become undetectable because they become so sophisticated in their technology that they don't waste any energy. They don't release energy into space, and therefore there's no sign of them to detect. And so we say, well, there must be some longevity. L, the length of time, typically, a civilization is visible. And now if we take the rate of production and multiply by that L, the end result is that thing we started out to find, which is the number of detectable civilizations in space. And the number is getting bigger. Seven new planets have been discovered in the last year. One planet is almost as big as Jupiter by the fourth star nearest to the Sun, a planet orbiting star 51 in the constellation of Pegasus. The latest estimate of the number of galaxies is now 50 billion. The estimated number of detectable civilizations 100 million million. Are any of these potential civilizations attempting to communicate with us? SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is listening. 
I made the first modern radio search in 1960. All over the world, large radio telescopes were being constructed because the, the beauty and power of radio astronomy had just been recognized. And also at that time, some very much more sensitive radio receivers were invented. The combination of these new telescopes and these new radio receivers gave us a sensitivity very much greater than we've had before. And this was a first. We had, in our abilities, crossed a very important threshold. So it made sense to search. It didn't require anything special in the activities of the extraterrestrials. If they were just like us, we could detect them. Conducting a SETI search from the Earth's surface uh, is very challenging and very difficult. And the reason is you detect intelligent signals all the time. It's just they're all from us. All from us, and some with an impressive shelf life. Call sign GBTT, Golf Bravo Tango Tango. Over 30 years after it was first sent, a coded wartime signal intended for the Queen Mary was received by its successor, the QE-2. The QE-2 uses the same call sign. The signal that came out was addressed to Golf Bravo Tango Tango, which is the call sign of the QE-2, but it was the signal letters of the Queen Mary. And the radio officer who received the signal recognized the uh, Golf Bravo Tango Tango and thought it was for this ship. But in reality, when he received it, he realized it was a wartime signal, which had obviously been bouncing around in space for 30 odd years. Sent to the Queen Mary in the 40s, the signal arrived in February 1978. Was it bouncing through space, as Captain Arnott suggested, or somehow intercepted and sent by someone or something we have yet to identify? Have we ever detected an intelligent signal from another world? Jerry Amon may have straight from a fixed source near the center of the galaxy to Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope, a telescope larger than three football fields. started a data run on August 15th, 1977, that lasted for about three days. And through the printout, I was recording and marking all of those signals that were unusually strong, and I came across one that was stronger than I'd ever seen before by many times. And I was so astonished that I wrote the word wow, exclamation point, over in the margin without even thinking. To have signals coming in only one channel indicates the possibility that this was some either unique astronomical event or that it was generated by some transmitter. We are resurveying the sky using more modern equipment, and we have passed through that same region of the sky and have not seen the wild source again. Eamon and his associates checked their equipment and their figures. Studies eliminated glitches, space probes, and terrestrial sources. We have ruled out effectively uh, nearby spacecraft or space debris or satellites in Earth orbit, and we've certainly ruled out anything close, very close to the radio telescope, like an airplane flying through the, the beam of the telescope. Uh, we have not ruled out the possibility that this is actually a signal from extraterrestrial intelligence. The transmission of a signal is one thing. But are there ways to travel these vast distances of space? 
If you imagine that this balloon is our universe, we live in three dimensions in the surface of the balloon. And it has been suggested that they may be what are called wormholes, that if you like, sort of run across the balloon from one side to the other, or connecting points, um, which would allow us to travel from one side of the balloon via a shortcut to the other side of the balloon. Imagine that uh, this sheet of paper is our universe and we're at point A and we want to go to point B. Normally, we would have to travel through from A to B through the universe. What would be nice, of course, would be if we could find some way of bending the universe in another dimension to bring those two points together and then step across the gap. Um, and that's a, a sort of space warp, if you like, warping the universe to bring those points closer together. As yet, the answer remains theoretical. For now, we are limited to sending craft into nearby space to gather information, capture images, and measure conditions. Could others be doing that too? With that question, we return to our fascination with something larger, something other. We return to our fascination as we continue to face the sky. Looking, listening, and longing. <laughs>